Chapter 8 Politics Midna tells a story. Law enforcement in the lower quarters. He was sitting alone in his rooms, recovering from the toll that the day's exertions had forced upon him. Russell reflected ruefully that he was beginning to get old. His teacher would shame him for succumbing to the years so readily, barely out of middle age and already he was thinking wistfully of retirement. The door opened behind him and the light footsteps on the carpet that covered the tiles told him it was the Princess Zelda. He thought momentarily of covering himself, the upper half of his body, replete with numerous scars, was exposed. He had been in the process of disinfecting another, newer wound across the top of his right bicep. Link had been much faster than Russell had anticipated. I believe this belongs to you. Something thumped against the carpet. Thank you. I was loath to lose it. Zelda circled around so that she was standing in front of him. You're hurt. It's nothing. Her hands glowed with a golden light, and the wound stitched itself closed. Where it had been there was but a faint line lighter than the skin around it. Who was fast enough to cut you? The young one. Link. When he saw the small smile that graced Zelda's face at the mention of the name, he inquired further. You met him, then? I did. You did very well, Russell, bringing him to me. There is a problem, Your Highness. She frowned. Oh. As you may imagine, today's events left rather a lasting impression on some of our aristocracy. Zelda again allowed herself a smile. I'll bet they did. Well. You do recall that after the murder of our dear magistrate Dotur, there was some unrest among their numbers concerning their personal safety. In light of today's events, unrest among our governors is growing still. They are losing faith in your ability to protect them, Zelda. Her countenance darkened. Perhaps our governors would do well to remember that certain practices ought not be paired together. I don't follow you. You don't shit where you eat, she said. He laughed and then hastily corrected himself. This is no laughing matter. The lower districts are becoming increasingly difficult to control, and Magistrate Ingo has informed me in no uncertain terms that he is taking law enforcement into his own hands. What's more, there are whispers that Chancellor Cole is moving to undermine your authority, looking to place it in the hands of the Council. Chancellor Cole is woefully ignorant of his own irrelevance, as is Ingo. No, the only thing that I am worried about is the Garuto, and their newest recruit. With all due respect, I don't think that one kid is enough to turn the Garuto from a nuisance into a threat. Zelda bent and picked up Russell's gilded sword from where she had dropped it upon entering the room. The blade shone lethally and Russell was reminded once again of how his own sword had wounded him. You fought him today. What did you think? He rubbed the spot high on his arm where the faint scar still shone with traces of magic. I think that he may be the greatest natural swordsman I have ever seen. Unpractised, but easily better than myself, or my teacher. She twirled the sword now, artfully, her long fingers manipulating the blade in gleaming, graceful arcs through the air. Myself and the Garudo King, Ganondorf, are a part of a delicate balance, Russell. Similarly, this city wavers between order and chaos, between darkness and light, on finer a point than you could know. Zelda let go of the gilded sword and, for but a moment, it spun freely in midair as the momentum carried its golden blade, and then Zelda caught it, one-handed, by the blade. Russell had found the blade, long ago, sold to him on the street by a man with a comically large pack and sporting a rictus grin. He had never in his years found another of its like, a sword that never dulled, sharper than any the finest smiths in Hyrule could make. Your Highness! He jumped to his feet, unable to help himself. He had never seen the gilded sword fail to do anything but slice cleanly through flesh as though it were air. She offered him the hilt of the sword. He saw that she had managed to pluck it from the air by the flat of the blade, never touching the edge. It balanced now on her palm, perfectly. He took the sword. Link, Russell, we'll tip that balance, one way or the other. Dappled as it was by the light of the early evening, 
filtered through the network of streets and bridges and buildings above him, the spirit temple almost looked serene. The sky was a brilliant red and, remembering the old rule of thumb, Link looked forward to fine weather tomorrow, and possibly further after that. Link He looked past the temple, up the street. Midna was floating there, arriving at the Garuto hideout just as he was. Rather than sitting on nothing, or pirouetting and flipping in midair, as was the norm, her tiny feet barely cleared the ground, and it seemed as if her shoulders were, for once, feeling the weight of the stone on her head. Did something happen? He asked. It's, no, nothing. Don't worry about it. You want something to eat? She held the door open for him and then followed him inside. I'm starving, truth be told. Follow me. She led him through the maze of rooms and clutter, something that he was certain he would never be able to navigate properly. They came to a dorm made out of metal, which, amazingly enough, appeared to be coated in frost. Put your tongue on the door handle, Midna said, although her heart did not seem to be in it. Link rolled his eyes and opened the door, only to be hit in the face with a blast of cold air and no small amount of snow. Midna floated into the small room made entirely of metal and frozen solid by some sort of magic. Slabs of meat hung from hooks dangling from the ceiling, and Midna sliced two steaks from these effortlessly, her hands seemed to momentarily become claws made out of shadow. They left the cold room and retreated to where they had eaten dinner the night before. Where is everybody else? He asked. Dunno. She waved her hands and fire seared the steaks to perfection in an instant. Dig in. They ate in silence for a bit, which Link found very unnerving. Certainly he could never claim to be a great conversationalist, but since he had met Midna it seemed as though he had had to endure a constant barrage of profanity, crude jokes, dry wit, and insults. The sudden removal of what had become background noise was eerie. Is everybody okay? He asked. She stopped, her fork halfway to her mouth. Once again, it seemed as though she ate far too much food for her small body. I was with Ganondorf. All I know is that the two of us are fine. What about your group? I don't know. We got separated, but I think Vissen got out all right. I was hoping to meet up with everyone here. Well, you're out of luck. We're the only two here. He did not ask how she knew this. But it's dark out now, isn't that? There are safe houses all over the city, she said. No member of the Garuto is stupid enough to go outside at night. They fell silent again, and Link listened to the night outside. The flickering light of the spirit temple suddenly seemed inadequate, and he couldn't help but think that what was light, really, to stop such a monster as the one that lurked now in the darkness? Midna. Eh. What is that? Thing. The nameless. She looked at him oddly. Why do you ask? He struggled to put it into words. Something was telling him that Midna knew more than she let on. I... Don't know. Maybe. It just seems like there's something you want to talk about. She sneered. What? Something I want to talk about. Since we got back, you haven't once made fun of my hat. It's a stupid hat. There. Happy. Midna. Yeah. I'm not wearing a hat. There was the sound of footsteps on the street outside, louder than the footsteps of any ordinary person could be. When they faded, Link exhaled a breath he did not know he had been holding. Do you want to know what it is? What it really is? The thought of such a dark creature wandering freely about the streets at night made him shiver. He imagined its slick form sliding through alleyways and loping across the expanse of the market district. Midna? Are you alright? She was not floating at all, instead looking very small and helpless with her legs curled up in front of her and her arms wrapped tightly around them. He lay a tentative hand on her shoulder and noticed that she was shaking slightly. It's something awful. Link, it really really is. It's the most horrifying thing you can imagine. She turned to him, her one exposed eye meeting his stare fervently. I can't tell you. 
she immediately directed her gaze back to the floor. Why not? Because you'll hate me if I do. He watched her stare at the floor for a few seconds, fists clenching and unclenching. He had never seen someone so obviously conflicted. I hate myself. Midna, tell me what happened. She shook her head. I'll tell you a story instead. Do you know whose aunt is? One of Zelda's viziers, isn't he? A.M.H. He and I are the only two surviving members of the Twilight race. Soon, one of us will kill the other, and the victor will become the last of our people. I... It can't be him. For him to be the only remnant of the Twilight. The mere mention of the mage's name was enough to send Midna into a rage, she spat the word as if it tasted foul and her hands crackled with suppressed magic. We used to live underneath Hyrule. The city goes on forever, further down than even the Twilight dared to go. Our parents told us stories of demons in the deep darkness, and of things with no name that were even worse than that. Every so often, you would get one brave warrior who would attempt to prove himself by venturing down there, but none of them ever returned. Except one. Zant? Link asked. Midna nodded. He was a prodigy. The second greatest Twilight Mage of all time. He did not bother asking Midna who the greatest Twilight Mage of all time was, sensing that she was only baiting him. He disappeared for months. We thought he had died in the dark like all the others before him, but we were wrong. Zant returned triumphant, a hero like our culture had never seen. A celebrity not only among our kind, but in all of Hyrule. There was a time where you couldn't find a kid who didn't have a poster of Zant up in their room somewhere. They... The princess even agreed to marry him. Link almost fell out of his chair. What? Princess Zelda? She shot him a look of utter contempt. No, don't be stupid. I mean the Twilight Princess. She was the ancestral ruler of the Twilight people. Anyways, the point I'm making was that Zant's star just kept on rising. Up out of the darkness, up past the Undercity, and eventually as high as you can get in this town. The castle, right. He thought of the endlessly complex sprawl of the city, and how minute it looked from the royal complex. Where he is now. He got a summons, from Zelda herself. So he goes on up to the castle. And that night, he and Zelda come down. That was the last safe night in the city. He followed the jerk of her head to the darkness outside. You mean? The nameless, whatever it is, never showed itself in the city before that night. Zant and Zelda met with the Twilight Princess herself, and the three of them all descended into the deep darkness of the city where nobody had been for centuries. That very same night, the Twilight people disappeared and a monster began stalking the citizens in the night. Midna looked up at him, and for the first time he noticed that something was different about her. Her face had a splotchy, uneven look to it, darker and scarred in some places. The same faint scars wound their way up and down both of her arms. Do you see what I'm saying? You're saying that Zant created the Nameless? I'm saying that Zant created the Nameless, or woke it up, or summoned it, and it killed every last one of the Twilight people. Except for me. And you know what? She snarled, I'm going to make sure that leaving me alive is his greatest mistake. Abruptly she stood, hovered, from her chair and turned away. I'm going to bed. I thought that you didn't sleep at night. Whatever. I'm tired now. Link stayed at the table long after she had left the room, watching the candles burn their way downwards and thinking about Midna's story, what it had meant, and most importantly, the questions she had neglected to answer. For starters, how had she survived? So you think Midna's a liar? No. Link swatted at the fairy emphatically. I'm just saying that maybe she's not telling the whole truth. But... That's lying. So maybe she is lying a bit, Link took another half-hearted swing at Navi as she fluttered through his field of vision, her hair trailing behind her in a luminescent stream moving as if it were water in the field of magical energy that kept her afloat. And don't tell her I said this. Why? Navi said, I'm not a liar. 
Link couldn't tell if she was joking with him or if her naivety meant she was really being honest. It was two days after the ill-fated raid on the castle, and Link's routine had fallen into a lull of going out during the day and wandering about the city. It was something he enjoyed, and each trip he had a new companion. Ganondorf and Vissen had taken him to a makeshift coliseum made of the rubble of collapsed buildings, where a Goran Zora team had handily beaten two off-duty guards in the marquee match of the day. He had gone fishing in the river with Colin and Ashe, frying up their catch for dinner that evening. So when he had ventured out this morning, Navi had tagged along and said she was going to introduce him to a friend of hers. You'll really like her, Navi said. She's really nice, probably the best innkeeper in the whole city. They were walking along a main thoroughfare, the wide street made of beaten white stone. Fruit and vegetable stalls were set up intermittently along each side of Link, and people hurried by with the Don T talked to me air of someone who was extremely busy. It was a beautiful day, the sun high enough in the sky that it shone straight down through the spires and bridges above them, illuminating everything in comfortable sunlight. Just as Link was thinking that it was as nice as a day in Hyrule City could get, there was a loud clatter of a cart tipping over and several shouted swear words. I don't care. I don't care if you've paid already, th magistrates making it clear that you've got to pay again. I don't understand, why is he? Because he's concerned about th safety of his citizens, that's why. How else are we to pay for our new guards, then? There was a deep hissing growl, the noise of a very large predator that was very on edge. Two men laughed heartily. The crowds parted quickly and Link saw that a cart full of food and drink had been toppled over. Fruit and cheese lay in the middle of a spreading pool of wine from a burst cask, its bittersweet scent quickly filling the air. Two guards were menacing a clearly terrified red-headed woman. Just what was terrifying here was immediately obvious, chained up between the guards was some kind of lizard, easily eight feet tall on its hind legs. Crude metal armor had been fastened to it, and it apparently had enough rudimentary intelligence to wield the wicked-looking sword clenched in its talons. Oh, no. Anju. Link, we have to do something. Link quickly realized that Anju, the woman being threatened, was the friend Navi had intended to introduce. He stepped calmly into the white space that had been cleared because of the commotion, and cleared his throat loudly. What's that? Piss off. One of the guards dismissed him and turned back to Anju. Now as you can see, we've hired some new hands as an additional security measure, he yanked on the lizard's chain, on account of the recent spate of terrorist activity. Now, cause it costs money to ensure the safety of our citizens, Magistrate Ingo has enacted a tax increase, effective immediately. I... I've already paid, Anju stammered, unable to tear her eyes from the beast. I don't have enough for what you're asking, I've already... The second guard slammed his sword into the toppled cart, eliciting a loud thunk and sending chips of wood spraying everywhere. You're trying my patience, woman. Are you going to defy the magistrate? Are you? Listen now. Link said loudly, I'm just as much a citizen as she is, and I don't want any of those beasts roaming the streets. And if you think I'll pay for him, well, think again. The guards turned to face Link now, as someone shouted from the assembled crowd, Green Hat Guy is right. We pay enough as it is, and you don't keep us safe at all. I'm not paying for no monster. The first guard narrowed his eyes, but then smiled. You know what? I see what the problem is here, and I understand completely. What you all need is a demonstration of the effectiveness of our new security. The second guard laughed and unchained the beast. Link reached for his sword. Watch out! Navi said in his ear, that's a little foes. Link tuned her out and waited for the beast to spring. However, it never came, as the guard pointed at Anju and yelled, go get her! The little foes turned and loped towards Anju in two easy strides. It raised its sword and swung, an untrained blow with more than enough brute force to kill the woman instantly. Link stopped the monster's blade with his own. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw both guards gape mutely, amazed that he had moved that fast. The Lizelfa's blade was crude, made of shoddy metal. When it raised the weapon and swung again, this time targeting Link, he swung his own sword and met it at just the right angle. 
the poorly crafted weapon was ineptly wielded, and met perhaps the finest sword ever made used with the deadly precision of Link's pure instinct. The lizard's sword shattered with one deep, ringing note, which rose into a cacophony as the pieces scattered on the stone. Call it off! Link shouted. The Lizalfos backed off and dropped the useless hilt, then cocked its head, waiting for instructions. Call it off! Link repeated. Use your claws! The guard bellowed, his face red, tear his guts out! The beast lunged forward, swinging a clawed arm far more adroitly than it had ever used the sword. Link sidestepped neatly, raising his blade and swinging it down in one smooth motion. The Lizalfo's head thumped wetly to the street, followed seconds after by its body, spewing the monster's dark and foul-smelling blood. Link sheathed his sword with a fanciful twirl, the shimmering blade untainted by the thing's blood. The guards stared blankly at their decapitated beast, which lay motionless in the street in a growing pool. I'm not paying for that! Someone yelled, it's broke! The crowd erupted into shears and laughter, several hands clapping Link on the back solidly. The two guards beat a hasty retreat, and Link found himself face to face with a stammering Anju, who could neither thank him enough nor apologize enough for causing him trouble. Link! Navi said happily, her high-pitched voice still somehow perfectly audible above the noise, This is my friend Anju! Presently, the streets cleared, the citizens returning to their daily toil, after several more congratulations and knowing Wink's accompanying mentions of the Garudo. Anju was left alone with Link and Navi, sitting on the steps of her humble inn. My whole shipment! Ruined, she said, gesturing at the food and drink that had been in the cart, now trampled underfoot and stamped into the soggy mess on the ground. The dead beast had been dragged away, undoubtedly somebody was going to try and eat it. Not that I blame you for it! She apologized hastily. Don't worry, Link waved away her stammering, maybe I should be apologizing to you. I'd feel terrible if you got into more trouble because of me. There's not much more trouble that I can get in, she sighed. I inherited this inn from my mother, we've run it for generations. It's on one of the busiest streets in the entire city, which is great for business, but it also makes my inn an extremely valuable piece of real estate. The magistrate keeps raising taxes in this district, looking to seize properties and sell them at a much higher cost. Why don't you just sell it yourself? Link asked. Anju gave a weary smile, because the magistrate enacts a commission on all property transactions in his district, not to mention the taxes on the sale. At the end of the day, he still ends up with the money, Link finished. He was beginning to see how the system infuriated Ganondorf, as well as the truth to Tetra's statement that everybody was trying to con somebody. But thank you, Anju said, it doesn't matter if he takes my in now, he would have done it anyways. But you showed them that they can't just do whatever they want. Somebody has to stand up to them. And it means the world to us. I can't believe that Magistrate Ingo. Navi fumed. How can they let him do that? Doesn't anybody care? Yes, said Anju. You do. Eventually, they said their goodbyes and began the walk back to the Spirit Temple. Although he was still somewhat wary of Ganondorf, Vissen, and Midna, and their mysterious motives, he felt that they were right in one respect, something had to change. And with things as terrible as they were now, he had no qualms in giving them the benefit of the doubt. At least Link knew that he was honest, and that he was acting for the people. If he could trust nobody else, he could at least trust himself. Link reflected that tomorrow was the third day since the raid, the day that Tetra had promised to return to him and get him back into the castle, and into the library. He liked Tetra. She seemed refreshingly honest, and honesty was a trait that Link was beginning to recognize as being more and more valuable. Chapter End <laughs>